everybody. My name is Jeremy Crow. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a Luciferian. I've been studying occultism and practicing it for about 20 years now, since I was 17. I'm 37 now. Um, when I first started out, I did still have a lot of superstitious kind of thinking about, about what occultism was and about uh, magic and things like that. Um, I went through an esoteric Freemasonry and I was involved with other esoteric orders such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, the OTO, um, and alternative religious movements such as the Gnostic Church of the Glorious Christ. I became an ordained priest in that after four years and served the congregation for another year after that. Um, now I, I am involved with the Order Luciferi, which I became the head of, um, and also I've founded a new esoteric order called the Ziggurat of Enki, which is kind of Babylonian mythology based, and it uh, it allows you to kind of interact with the um, the whole lodge, magical lodge type format, but in a in a much different way. There's no oaths of secrecy, and there's no requirement for a charter to start one. Uh, you just have to get the material. It's kind of inspired by some of the open source ideas. Um, but anyways, um, my talk is on occult practice in the new Luciferian era. So just to give you a little bit of background on what that even means, uh, Luciferianism is based off of the concept of, of Lucifer, obviously, uh, which isn't exactly considered an entity by, by most Luciferians. Um, it's more of an archetype. And this archetype is based off of the celestial phenomenon that was originally given the term Lucifer by the ancient Romans. And this was, uh, the, when you look up in the sky in the morning, the last bright object, star-like object in the sky, before the sun rises, after all the other stars have, have disappeared, uh, is Venus. And it kind of heralds the rising of the sun and uh, almost in the same way that a rooster kind of calls forth the light or calls forth the morning. And Lucifer is literally the Latin word that literally translates into bringer of light. And so it has that kind of uh, connotation that it's a force of enlightenment. And um, based on a lot of the mythology that has built up around it in folklore, we often think of this as forbidden knowledge, uh, such as that was given to humanity by Prometheus. Prometheus is considered uh, a, a light bringer or Lucifer uh, par excellence. So that's kind of the idea behind Luciferianism. It's, it's uh, bringing forth this forbidden knowledge. It's, it's exploring the forbidden knowledge first and also sharing it. So it's not a purely selfish philosophy. A lot of times people think, oh, it's left-hand path, and therefore it's a purely selfish ideology. Um, certainly rational self-interest is a part of Luciferianism, but there's also that teaching element, that wanting to empower others as well. Um, so it is typically considered a left-hand path, but, uh, but as I said, yeah, it has that other aspect to it. I like to refer to it as a complete path. Uh, because it doesn't reject works of light and such things as love and compassion, uh, but it does embrace that whole forbidden knowledge aspect and, um, and empowering of the self, but it also helps to share that knowledge. So the new Luciferian era is kind of my way of describing this kind of environment we find ourselves in, which is increasingly secular and atheistic. Um, so what is the relevance of occultism in an increasingly secular world? Is it even relevant anymore? Um, I think it is, although maybe we shouldn't call it occultism anymore because it's becoming more and more mainstream and accepted. There's a lot of science behind a lot of these occult practices or so-called occult practices. Um, just to start off with the basic um, you know, the, you know, basic uh, deep relaxation exercises is one of the most basic 
occult practices you could do. <laughs> and that's simply relaxing your body and uh, deeply relaxing it, going through all the different uh, muscle groups and relaxing each in turn. Uh, that has been studied, of course, by, by medical science and, and science in general. And there's something called the relaxation response that they, they refer to what the body goes through. It, it triggers this response when you become deeply relaxed. And it boosts the immune system. Uh, it starts to heal tissues. Um, all kinds of good things happen. So that is something that is, is firmly entrenched in, in science, and, and it's not really occult anymore. <laughs> um, in, similarly, meditation, which can mean a bunch of different things, but uh, you know, that including concentration, um, contemplation, and um, self-hypnosis and altered states such as that, all of these things have been studied by science extensively, and there are different brainwave uh, states. Uh, pro the brain produces a predominance of certain brainwave frequencies when you're in these different states. So it's been, uh, it's not just a quantitative analysis, but qualitative. Like there's actual frequencies of brain waves that they can measure and they can tell when you enter into certain altered states. So that isn't really occult anymore. It's not really an esoteric practice if med modern medical science understands it, right? But it's still considered a practice to enter into these altered states. Um, now, we know that when we enter into certain altered states, we become more suggestible. And that means essentially that our imaginative function becomes much more empowered to, to create these imaginative immersive environments, fully immersive, just like what we're experiencing right now, but based off of internal inputs, basically. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things we can do with that. Now, we know that the brain will react in the exact same way and send signals to the rest of our body when we strongly visualize or imagine something it reacts the same way as if it was actually happening. So for instance, if you were to imagine yourself going to the refrigerator, taking out a cold lemon out of the crisper, slicing it open and sticking it in your mouth and just giving it a big squeeze and a bite, you know, if you actually sit there and, and concentrate on that visualization, you're going to start salivating. You know, your body reacts to that. In professional sports, we know that a lot of the time they, they use visualization practices, such as in, in pro basketball, when they're not actively out there practicing, dribbling and doing layups, uh, they will sometimes they sit there and actually just go over a perfect layup every time uh, and doing that over and over. And you can visualize doing that a hundred times and it has an effect. It actually helps program the neural pathways in the brain and in the entire body, the, the, the synapses that control the muscles and the, the program essentially that you're running when you do a perfect layout. Your body is being conditioned for that just by visualizing it. And so we know that these practices that have been used for millennia, we are understanding how they work. And they're still valid, they're still useful, and are being used by an ever-increasing number of people. We also have such things as lucid dreaming. And oftentimes people consider this a form of astral travel. And this is one of the cornerstones of occult tradition in you know, various different shamanic groups around the world, uh, and even more you know, highly organized, like esoteric orders. They're, the core practices often include some form of astral travel. Now, lucid dreaming is when you fall asleep, enter into a dream state, and then while in the dream state, you realize that you're in a dream state and, be, and don't wake up immediately. <laughs> Um, although I, I suppose for that split second you're in a lucid dream before you wake up, if you wake up right away. <laughs> um, but there are techniques to keep yourself in, in it for longer. And you can experience the dream state in a fully conscious manner. 
And this opens up all kinds of possibilities. Um, we're actually experiencing the same, I call it the hologram generator that we're experiencing right now, this fully immersive experience. Right now it's based on information coming from our sense organs. But when we're asleep and dreaming, it's coming from presumably internal sources. Um, and it, it's almost like a, a user interface, uh, a, an experience that the, is generated by the mind so that we can interact with the, the environment that we're getting the information about. <laughs> it's a little bit convoluted, but it's sort of like watching the world through a, a screen on a video camera um, rather than directly experiencing reality. And that's how we always experience the world, whether we're awake or whether we're dreaming. And a lucid dream, you can actually enter into the lucid dream state directly from a waking state without first falling asleep, becoming unconscious, letting a dream arise, and then realizing it's a dream. You can actually enter it directly, and there are techniques to do that. And that, um, there are, there's a scientist out there who has devoted his entire career to studying lucid dreaming phenomena. And he refers to this as a WILD, which is an acronym for Wake Induced Lucid Dream. Now, occultists typically refer to that as an astral projection. You know, it's the same thing. It's the same state that you're entering. And I know there's a lot of people that will, will argue because it's a very convincing experience. <laughs> when you're in it, you believe that it's, it's completely real. And it is real in a sense. It's, it's just not based off of sensory data. It's based off of something else. But it's the same function of the mind that's generating it. And so that's why it feels so real. Because we're experiencing it right now. But as I said, based on different inputs. So these different occult practices are, are, as I said, they keep getting more and more understood by mainstream science. And we keep finding that they are indeed useful. Um, what are some other ones? Oh, ceremony. So ceremony, this is a big one. How many different cultures indulge in ceremony. Even the purely secular society has ceremonies such as weddings. You know, why do we have a wedding ceremony if you're an atheist? You, you're, not, you're not trying to get God to bless your union, you know, or any kind of deity or anything like that. Uh, you're just getting some kind of legal contract, right? You're getting the, the state to bless it, in a sense. It's, it's not really about that if you're an atheist. It's more about marking a milestone with a ceremony, making a big deal out of it, right? And when somebody dies, you know, that's another one. So um, all these different things, you know, coming into adulthood, often a lot of cultures have a ceremony. When somebody's born, there's a ceremony. And not only that, but we have these little ceremonies, like uh, ritualistic type behavior where some people before they go into uh, a meeting at, at their work they'll they'll gear themselves up for it to to get themselves uh, confident um, athletes again um, they use certain ceremonies where they'll do something that most people would consider superstitious but they do it to kind of gear themselves up and we find that even if you don't believe in the power of ritual, it still affects you. It still makes you more effective in whatever you're doing the ritual for. Whether that could be grieving, if you do some sort of grieving ritual, you deal with the grief better. And there's a, there was an article in Scientific American a couple of years ago that went into this and they did an experiment where they did something that was even quite trivial. They had a, a lottery where the participants, one person would win $200 and get to leave early. And so they built it up by getting them all to, to, uh, to figure out what they were going to do with the 200 if they won it. And then they just declared who the winner was, that person left. And then they went through and they had part of the group 
do this kind of little ritual that they had come up with where you draw something that expresses your grief. They put a bit of salt on it and ripped it up, and then they counted to ten five times. <laughs> and they just made it up, and uh, these people didn't, weren't people that necessarily believed in the power of ritual. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But they all reported to have dealt with that grief, you know, even though it was something very uh, mundane and very, you know, minor, they still felt better about losing in that lotto than the people who didn't do the, that ritual practice. Um, so another aspect of, of ceremony and ritual is that we have a part of our brains in the triune division of the brain. Um, science has, has decided that there's a part of our brain that we refer to as the reptilian brain. And it's the oldest part of our brain. It, basically is the brain stem and the cerebellum. And then beyond that we have the paleocortex, or sorry, yeah, paleo, paleo mammalian cortex. And then beyond that we have an even more advanced part of our brains that is the neo mammalian cortex. <laughs> um, and so they have uh, a lot of higher brain functioning happens in the neo mammalian cortex, but a lot of what we do is still based on that reptilian brain. And this includes fight or flight uh, reaction, uh, a lot of instinctual behavior, um, and ritual. The, the, um, the desire to perform rituals, to do ritualistic behavior, to mating dances in, in lizards, you know. <laughs> this is all controlled by what we call the, the reptilian brain. And it's, it's deeply affected by symbolism and repetition. And so when you do these types of rituals, in a sense, you are interacting with the most ancient and deepest part of our brain physiology. And um, there's, some, there's something that I like to, to call the, the complete harmonized self. And this is kind of the, the ideal for the fully individuated person. So right now, we typically are quite fragmented in our own personalities. We you know, want this, but we also want that, you know, and we get, we're torn apart sometimes by these things. Um, if we can get all the different parts of ourselves working in harmony toward common goals, then we can achieve uh, a lot more. I mean, think of the difference between an incandescent light bulb, where the light is just going everywhere, compared to a laser beam, where all of the light waves are are focused and directed in the same direction. You know, it's much more powerful. It can cut through solid objects, you know. Um, so if we can get ourselves out of this dualistic thinking, such as a lot of people, they refer to the higher self. Well, to me, that, I don't like to use that term because it automatically implies a lower self. Just by pure definition, you can't be, you can't have something higher without the, something lower to, com to compare it to, right? Automatically, you have a lower self if you're talking about a higher self. It's another way that we have to judge ourselves, in a sense. We, ha we judge parts of ourselves that are more spiritual or pure and call that our higher self. And then the other part, the other parts of ourselves that maybe we feel less comfortable with, we can comfortably put that in the lower self category and shove it down and, and suppress it like we always already are doing. <laughs> so we already are our higher selves in a sense because we are the part of ourselves that we're comfortable with and accept typically, you know, even if you have low self esteem. <laughs> um, but, uh, to get rid of that dichotomy, I think we have to try and engage our whole complete selves and get 
the different parts working in harmony. So ritual is one way to engage uh, this reptilian brain part of ourselves. And I think that uh, ritual is, is one, of the, one of the best ways to do that. Um, now, other occult practices, just an honorable mention, um, some forms of divination, say um, pendulum scrying or, or even a Ouija board. You know, a lot of these things have been studied and there's something in, they call the ideomotor response or reflex. Um, IDM is the short form for it. And what it means is that on a subconscious or unconscious level, we are, our body reacts to certain ideas, even if we're not fully conscious of these, these ideas. So when you are holding the pendulum and you ask a question and you already know which, which way it's supposed to move to mean what, um, the body will make these almost imperceptible movements and the pendulum amplifies those little tiny almost imperceptible movements so that you can actually observe it. It's a way to kind of interact with the, the contents of our subconscious selves, the parts of ourselves that we're not fully conscious of. We have the, our point of power, our seat of power is our consciousness. This is where we have the ability to, to set changes. It's like being a king or a queen, a sovereign. It's like being a sovereign over a, an empire. And now we don't necessarily consciously um, perform the functions of each aspect of that empire, but we do set the commands. And there are different ways to go about doing that. There are different ways to, to use the conscious mind to set these, to set the intentions for how everything will play out in our kingdom. So for example, uh, we also have what you could call dream incubation. So we can't always control what we're going to end up dreaming, but we can incubate certain concepts that will work themselves into our dreams um, through various practices while we're awake and conscious. Uh, of course, if you're in a lucid dream state, you are conscious within the dream and you can have an even more direct uh, impact on the dream content, but uh, that's not the only way to impact dream content. There are lots of different ways of doing that. And, and all these things, as I to get back to my original point, have been studied by mainstream science. And psychology at one point was considered a pseudoscience, you know. But now we have, uh, you know, psychology is, is quite well respected, <laughs> you know. Um, and whenever we've discovered the usefulness of one of these so-called pseudosciences or occult practices, um, luckily, we live in a scientific uh, culture, which will say, well, if it works, let's use it and throw away the super, strip away all that superstition and, uh, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that this, uh, in what I call the new Luciferian era that we find ourselves in, I think that this is going to continue to increase. We're going to, because we don't have the same strictures against exploring certain things that were once considered forbidden knowledge. We, we don't have those same, you know, an atheist isn't going to feel afraid of entering into a lucid dream state, for example, directly from a waking state. You know, they're not going to ascribe superstitious concepts to it, and this frees us up to, to explore our, our true potential. And so that's, I think, the role of the occult practice in the new Luciferian era. Um, were there any questions? <laughs> so, if you call yourself a Luciferian, are you an theistic one or an atheistic Luciferian? Uh, I like to use the term apatheistic. <laughs> uh, apathy, theistic. So, I don't really care whether 
whether either one is true or not, I'm still going to go about living my life the way that I've been living my life regardless. If I were to find out, yes, the you know entities that I've experienced and interacted with are genuinely independent, self-aware, conscious entities. You know, they definitely seem to be, but whether they are or not is another question. If I were to know for sure that they are, yes indeed, independent, fully conscious, self-aware entities, it wouldn't change it wouldn't change anything about how I live my life. If I were to find out on the other hand that they are aspects of myself that I that are, you know, become personified within say a lucid dream state. Um, then that it wouldn't change anything either. So I, you know, I like to have the kind of mental flexibility to kind of explore either whenever it's appropriate. A pragmatist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good word too. <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the end goal of of the practice, um, a big a big focus is on utilizing this this awesome opportunity we have as living conscious beings um, and taking full advantage of that. And and I think that even without any kind of uh, afterlife. Um, then the occult practices still are very useful, as I, I've, I hope I've shown. Um, you know, it is also useful to have some kind of story about what happens after you die that you can kind of uh, contemplate and, and look and look forward to potentially as as one possible thing that might happen. <laughs> and I do have my own kind of story about what I think. Um, might happen after the death of the physical body. Um, so, the, the, one of the main goals, as you were saying, uh, being a sovereign of your own life, uh, that's uh, typically referred to as autotheistic, um, even becoming your own god. Uh, but also beyond that, you have uh, a term that, that's apotheosis, which is actually uh, something becoming, uh, attaining the status of a deity. And that's a little bit different than autotheistic or autotheism because autotheism is, is an internal kind of thing. It's about like you personally being the god of your own world in a sense. But uh, apotheosis is sort of like some people have achieved a certain form of apotheosis such as uh, Alexander the Great where you know, even thousands of years later, we still know who he was, and and his and, and he still inspires people, uh, and so has an influence on the world even after long after the death of his physical body. Um, and that we don't need to have any kind of superstitious belief to understand that form of apotheosis. Uh, but maybe, just maybe, there is another level to it. You know, a more esoteric or subtle aspect to apotheosis where. Uh, perhaps you can achieve a state where you do have some sort of self-aware consciousness or self, uh, conscious self-awareness that, that maybe perhaps can survive the death of the physical body. And so that is something that, that I like to try and work toward, uh, although I know that it, it may not be possible, but uh, there are certain things that I, that I like to do that... Um, multitask <laughs> so they also would would hopefully uh, in my understanding work toward that goal if it exists if it if it is indeed possible while simultaneously improving my life in, in in the here and now as well as establishing a powerful legacy so that I can continue to have an influence on the world after after my body stops working <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> now, I've read accounts of where people have had these uh, out of body experiences, and, they, and from what I understand, it's also been verified to a certain degree in scientific testing where they were able to leave their body and access knowledge that they would not themselves already have. Have you ever experienced that yourself? And it's the obvious explanation of that if you don't leave your body, how would this knowledge come to you that you've never been exposed to consciously or subconsciously, and yet it comes to you? Well, I think it's pretty much impossible to know whether we've subconsciously been exposed to it. So there is that explanation right off the bat. Um, but uh, there's also another explanation that we may not have come into contact with certain information, but our brains may have compiled it subconsciously. So a lo all knowledge comes from processing information, right? Uh, obtaining date, raw data and processing it. That's knowledge, right? So if we had come into enough subconscious or conscious information, it's possible that our brains could compile that as well. So we don't necessarily need to have directly come in contact with it, but we could have come to that conclusion ourselves in some way. Um, also, there is a possibility that information is traveling, you know, between, between us in more subtle ways than we understand right now. Sort of like an esoteric internet? Yeah. <laughs> like we do have energy bodies, and that is something that has been studied by science. We do, our bodies give off electromagnetic uh, energy and it interacts with other people's bioelectric energy and there's, it's possible that there could be some sort of information transfer through that. So what may feel like um, an actual body experience, maybe like a virtual reality experience, you know, on the but we do, yeah, well, we do have that, this experience generator, generator, as I was talking about, the hologram, I like to call okay. it, yeah. that we're experiencing right now, you know, uh -huh. and when we're in a dream state, it, it could be that same experience generator, that fully immersive experience generator function of the mind that could be operating when we're having that uh, uh, near-death experience. Oh, or, yeah, and even potentially... Uh, alien abduction experiences and, and things like that have been studied uh, as potentially related to that. Uh, actually, the alien abduction experiences, like uh, when people say that, they're, that the spaceship has landed in their backyard, there's been actual in the, in the soil markings and also radiation readings. That there's there. also been lots where it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's really beneficial that we're in this sort of time where that's not part of the home, that we can have frank discussions about is this useful, are these practices relevant to our lives, and they make us more um, holistic people that are more in control of all our faculties, mm -hmm. you know, instead of being scattered for <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's incredible. Like, 
in this new Luciferian era, uh, we don't have to worry about getting, getting put to death <laughs> if, our, if our esoteric interests are found out, you know. Uh, we can, uh, you know, here in Toronto, it's very uh, cosmopolitan and open, you know, open-minded kind of environment for us as well. <laughs> Some places in the world, even in a lot of places in the States, uh, there's a lot of people that, that don't openly talk about that because it could cost them their job, their livelihood, it, children could be taken away from them, you know. So, but it's changing, you know, and, uh, and I think we lo we're lucky to live here in Toronto too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the whole world is, 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 gra is you know, waking up to this idea that, uh, um, and it's kind of ironic that the people that are still holding on are seem to be holding on a lot tighter. <laughs> There's more extremism, it seems. Yeah. The people that are holding on are, are, are like fighting to, they're clawing and digging <laughs> to, keep, to keep a hold of it. Um, so it can be kind of scary too, but it, you know, there's also, whenever we go through one of these major cultural transitions, uh, there does seem to be a bit of upheaval, upheaval that goes along with it, kind of birthing pains, you could call it, I suppose. So, so you think that this increasing extremism isn't because they're taking over, it's because they're just pushing it back against something that's steadily coming. Yeah, it's like the last gasp. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a kamikaze <laughs> toward the end of the world, uh, World War II, uh, in the grips of a dying Japanese empire. Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's almost like a enlightenment to uh, uh, consciousness being sort of like this percolating bubbles. You know, it used to be that it was more commonly, you know, these little bubbles of consciousness in different towns and you know, places around the world and that. And then empires would gradually sort of make bigger bubbles that, you know, <laughs> Golden Age, the legendary yeah. Golden Age, That's, right? Yeah. So it's like oh, yeah. the, fear of, the fear of the unknown and that sort of thing. So it's like, I think the whole Golden Age kind of uh, the the call to return to this Golden Age is is kind of like uh, based off of the whole uh, the womb, in a sense. Yeah. You know, when yeah. we there was in a sense a Golden Age on a microcosmic level, <laughs> so people feel like yeah, there was this time when everything was perfect and. We lived in, you know, perfect harmony and utopia. And everything was just you know, abundant. Uh, we didn't have to work for food and <laughs> had all the free time in the world. And, you know, well, we did when we were in the womb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was never good enough then, but yeah. it was like, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs>